uh, the last class we probably should call further, further examining of the mind of Christ. And this one we'll just call How Bebop Won the War. <laughs> Now we can call this one the uh, practical applications of the wisdom of God. The last one was whatever they wrote down. I really don't. I'm just I make this stuff up as I go. <clears throat> All right, First Corinthians chapter four, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> we've been examining this back and forth. Uh, contrast of the wisdom of this world versus the wisdom of God in a mystery. <clears throat> it's also a contrast of the mind of the flesh versus the mind of Christ. And um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Uh, let's go ahead and read verse 8. No, let's read verse, yeah, let's read 8 and 9. <clears throat> now ye are full, now ye are rich, you have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were, appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. <clears throat> um, I, I've looked up several different translations of this uh, part in, in verse 8. For now, now you are full, now you are rich, you have reigned as kings without us. And uh, Coney Bear's translation says it like this. You have seated yourselves upon your throne. <laughs> and from this, you're getting a contrast. You're getting this contrast of the wisdom of the world that if you'll promote yourself, if you'll come across as somebody important or whatever, then people will be impressed with you. You gotta, what is it? You gotta market yourself, you got you know, all that kind of junk. And, and therefore, um, you know, you'll have an impact. <clears throat> and so Coney Bear is saying, you, you have seated yourselves upon your throne. Um, and <clears throat> again, remember that he's talking to the Corinthian church. He's not talking to rank sinners out here. <clears throat> and so he's talking to people who saw the cross really as a means of spiritual privilege, honor, blessing. They didn't see it as a, an example of Christ crucified and an example of how they were to proceed. Um, and then, you know, Paul adds to that, well, I would to God that you did reign. I wish, I wish you did reign. Um, <clears throat> And then I wrote, why did Paul, uh, what did Paul mean by that? You know, you've set your, you know, you've set yourself upon your thrones. I would to God that you did reign. The answer is simple. Who is it that is now sitting on the throne and reigning? That's right. It's, the, it's a slaughtered lamb. <laughs> so Paul's going, hey, that would be good. I like that idea. I wish that you did reign in a true way with the Lord because you because only that lamb nature truly reigns. <clears throat> um, these words of contrast said by Paul was said by one who had been made a spectacle to the world, verse 9. <clears throat> um, when, uh, when he says in verse 9, for I think that God set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were, appointed to death, I think he's. Um, I think he's pointing now to a reality that most Christians don't understand, but Paul constantly refers to it, and it is this concept that life comes out of death. 
But life doesn't just come out of any death, folks. It comes out of a selfless death with no, no thought of blessing of yourself, but just freeing others. Now, that's a really rough way of saying it, but I think you can sort of get the idea. There's much more to it, and it's much more refined than that, but, but that's sort of the idea. Um, so, uh, well, let me read this again. However, if there was any validity to the fact that the Corinthians seemed to be in a period of resurrection, meaning you have reigned, if there's any validity to the fact that they seem to be in a period of resurrection, that can only come by death. Who was it that had borne the death? I think Paul and his guys, because it appears that it may have been the apostles as described in verse 8 through 10. They seem to be burying the dead. And I believe, and this is, this is something I believe, you don't have to believe this, um, you don't have to believe anything I say, but, but something that I, I believe is that the apostles, the 12, um, uh, Paul, anybody who first was taking the message out, and, 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 in a, and in a sense, you could say that the first church was the apostles. In a sense, you could say that, and there was nobody else. So they had a responsibility, get ready, not just to carry the message in terms of preaching, but to carry the message in terms of how they lived. Because it was a, it's like what we saw last class in First Peter of, of you see your calling, that this is true of Christ crucified, and you're one with him, and therefore this is, this is your calling. This is what you're called to. And it was Christ crucified. It was... Uh, that sentence of death being in them <clears throat> and uh, and that God hath chosen not just to believe but to suffer with him with the result that life comes out of that death that there would that the wh what is the I mean there's a famous saying that says the seeds of the church are the death of the martyrs I mean if you you know I don't think any Nobody's ever heard that and gone, ah, that's stupid. <laughs> but they probably, you know, if you applied it to them and said, well, why don't you begin to die and go through suffering for others? They go, oh, no, I want to reign. You have set yourself upon your thrones, you know. <clears throat> and they did it because, because their concept of the cross was a me, it was me-centered. Blessing centered toward me. Now remember, that was the very thing that doomed Israel. Because God called them. He said, I will bless thee and make you a blessing. And they left off the last part. And they just wanted to be the object of blessing all the time. Okay? So they doomed themselves. And the, the church is in danger of doing the same thing. <clears throat> Not not the churches out there that denominate this church. <laughs> However, it could apply to them, but I ain't going to do that. All right. So, um, so these guys have taken that on as their assignment. There's not going to be anybody else or anybody else that would come would be in a false image if we didn't bear the image of Christ crucified. If we didn't be made conformable to his death. Does that at least make sense? So these guys, are, they're committed to it. It's, like, it's not like, you know, it's like Jesus, you know. You know, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say then? Father, save me from this hour, but for this hour came, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Um, you know, those who comprehend the wisdom of God in a mystery understand that this, that we're, we've actually been called to help proliferate this. No, we're in the sense of this. No, we're, we cannot do any kind of dying or suffering 
that brings about atonement. Jesus' death atoned for sins, okay? We're not talking about atonement. But we are talking about life out of death. We are talking about a greater release of resurrection life. And that's what Paul was talking about in um, um, Philippians 3.10. Um, was that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. I also want to know him, or with that, the fellowship of his sufferings by means of being made conformable to his death. Because why? Let's get real. Just get real with that, you know, and consider it in true light. You can't know him in the power of his resurrection unless you're conformable to his death. Is that true or not true? And guess what? You'll never fellowship in his sufferings unless you've gone down into his kind of death. So it must come from that, and that's why Paul said, I want to know this, I want to know this, but I can only know this and know this by this. And it's not a knowledge. It's a conformity. So he didn't say, I want to know you in your death. He said, I want to be made conformable to you. <clears throat> All right. Well, why? Why would anybody? What? What? You know, and you hear that. Well, you, well, those crazy people at Acts and New Creation, they talk about death all the time. Why would anybody want to go the way of death? Well, if you consider that what I'm saying might have some validity, that the first apostles viewed this thing like, this is our calling. There's not going to be another generation unless we bear witness. Not just witness, and you do know there when it talks about bearing witness that the word witness is martyr. It is. Look it up in the Greek. It's, it, it's not go yak about it. You know? You know, Jesus died for you. Well, you know, well, I'd like to see a little proof of it. You know. Well, don't talk to me, you know. <laughs> go, to, go to Acts over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's their, that's right. That's their calling. That's what <laughs> but you see, there. You know, I'm I'm kind of with the wisdom of this world in the sense of, you know, if I really had a choice, I'd rather not choose death. I really wouldn't. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. I'd really rather. I mean, in my mind, when I first got saved, I wanted to be a great evangelist. And, and I really thought I was going to be that until God sent me to a place and God introduced me to the message of Christ crucified and it shattered, you know, more than I even know. But one thing is it changed the whole direction of my life. <clears throat> All right. Well, that's the grace of God to even bring me to a place where I could hear it, you know. <clears throat> but what if every succeeding generation, now remember when we had Hebrews class and we got to Hebrews 11, do you, does anybody remember that that book was about two things? Number one, it was about succeeding generations. It kept talking about, you know, Abraham did so-and-so in relationship to Isaac, and Isaac did so-and-so in relationship to, and the, the second thing that he did in relationship to them was it all related to one person dying and the next generation receiving a blessing. Remember? They're on their deathbed and they're da-da-da-da and you saw it just over and over and you kind of go, whoa, you know, this is sort of amazing that the faith chapter is faith in life out of death. It's not faith for Cadillacs or Beamers or Lexus. What else? I'm hearing, what are they saying in their little mind? Jaguar. It's not all of that. And, you know, if you need a car and you just feel like God wants you to have a Beamer, then believe for it. But, but don't, don't put that in Hebrews 11 because they, it's not that, that ain't what's going on, okay? <clears throat> All right. Um, 
Let's see. Let me make sure I got this. All right. So, however, if there is any validity to the fact that the Corinthians seem to be in, in a period of resurrection, that can only come by death. Who was it that had borne the death? It appears that it may have been the apostles as described in verse 8 through 10. When the contrast of verse 8 with verse, um, with verse 9, you hear Paul saying something like this. You have all you want. This is, I'm, this is my paraphrase of verses 8 and 9. <laughs> you have all you want. In contrast to us, you have become kings. Our place has been to be last and sentenced to death. Clearly, our lot is to die so that you and others gain resurrection. We are weak, but you are strong. This is Christ to us. <laughs> this is Christ crucified to us. This is the Jesus that we follow. <clears throat> All right, so throughout these verses, Paul contrasts the state of those who remain in death with those who live in resurrection as described in verse 8. Paul and those with him seem to have chosen the place of going in advance of the rest of the body of Christ into death so that they may have more life. Now, folks, isn't that sort of in reality what, what you're doing for the next generation? That you have embraced, you have embraced the faith and you're not living. I mean, come on, we're clearly we're not living for ourselves or to gain some sort of great height in spirituality. I mean, we're constantly accused of, well, you must think you're something or you this or that or whatever, when clearly we don't. I mean, look around. You know, the only thing good about this place is the work that Nisi did on it as far as the painting and all that stuff. It's all we got going for us. <clears throat> um, there, you know, we have believed that God wants more than us. And we're willing to sow these seeds into the ground for something greater. And we're willing to believe for that. We're willing to believe for that. That's the faith that we walk in. We live by the faith of the Son of God who loved, so much, he lo who loved us by giving himself for us. That's the one that I got crucified with and now lives in me. That's Galatians 2.20. <laughs> All right, so um, they have been set forth, set forth by God for the appointed task of bearing death. Paul walks around as a man on death row, sentenced to death. I'm sure I've got it in here somewhere, but I'll make the, a comment now that I've been, been thinking about for some weeks now, and I'm sure I've only been thinking about it for some weeks now because the Holy Spirit keeps bringing it to my mind. Um, and, and that's in relationship to why we are able to lay down our lives for certain people and not for others. Why we get upset instead of immediately going into death over some people, uh, we get upset with them and feel hurt by them because we expected more of them. Well, now let me, let me say what I mean though. And that is, um, I think that there is the possibility of embracing the cross in relationship to Christ crucified, embracing Christ crucified in relationship to those that we appear, we, we, that appear to us as ungodly or sinners or enemies or, or weaker than us or less than us. Because we go, well, I can, I can, die for them they need life but when it's somebody who we might consider above us or equal with us for some reason Christ crucified it click it gets clicked off and it's like 
our expectations are, frankly, our expectations is for Christ crucified in men. Yes. <laughs> now, I know this by experience. I actually learned this by examining patterns in my own self and going, this is stupid. If Christ is life, if he's a nature, he's not picking and choosing who he lays his life down for. He, it doesn't matter to him. This is, but if this is an expectation or if this is something I'm doing, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, okay, I, I'm on board with this. Don't get on board with this, people. No, seriously, because it just ends in making you miserable or murder or something. Something, you know, something, but it's never, it never ends good. Okay, so there's, a, there's just a, um, don't, don't pick up a basket of Christ crucified and start carrying it around and going, okay, here, oh, poor miserable creature, here, I lay down my life for you. Oh, here, you know, you need my help, you need Christ crucified, my help, you know. And, you know, I give this to you. But then somebody that we respect or that we were looking to or that we thought would come through, da da da, da they don't. And we, uh, <laughs> where's my basket? It's gone. You know? And it's just all of this war. And, and all of these thoughts that we would never have towards somebody really yucky, you know what I mean, that's messed up, We, you know, Yes. Yeah, it's something, she said, it's more like something you do than something you be. That's bad grammar, Kelly. And Mallory will get you for that. I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, you had your hand up. Well, I do. I, you know, that being on thing, I got affected by that when I was in Bible school, actually. And that was, um, you know, you've heard the story, but I've never applied it to this. Um, one time I was um, sitting, we had a little kitchen area, and I was sitting in there studying, and break week came up. And a bunch of the kids were getting ready to go out to Lee Park and, you know, go have fun and stuff like that. And they said, hey, Randy, let's go, man. We're going to go have fun. And, you know, it's guys and girls. It's, come on, it's going to be great. Let's, you know. And I said, no, no, I, I really, I really want to stay here and stay. And they said, man, it's break week. And I said, what, a break from Jesus? I said, if he's our life, there is no break from Jesus. <laughs> and that was the feel that I was getting. Now, maybe it wasn't that, and maybe I falsely accused him, which I'm totally capable of. But the feel that I got was that they needed a break from Jesus, you know, <clears throat> because the pressure was just so much. <laughs> Anybody getting this of Christ crucified? <clears throat> okay. That made me start examining myself and go, you know what, is Christ crucified something that I'm, it's like, <gasps> and I'm holding my breath until I can finally get away and just let down, and this is kind of some of what Mallory was talking about, where I can just let down and be me. <laughs> and, um, and God dealt with me. And he said, and I, you know, I was still, you know, I mean, I am still knowing the Lord now and wanting to know the Lord. And I was then, and I, he just dealt with me and I just, I just saw it and I just broke because I saw that it had gotten so easy to be Jesus without it being Jesus, to be Christ-like without it being Christ. But 
the toll that that takes on you. Because it does take a toll on you. Because it's, it's burnout. Okay, well, what is burnout? Let's, let's just examine that. Well, burnout is trying to be something you're not for, for a long amount of time until you can't do it anymore. Okay, well, I understand that. Believe it or not, I would never want anybody to experience burnout because I would never want anybody to be faking it that long under that much pressure and having to go through that stuff. I'd rather them just learn Jesus by the Holy Spirit and go, I didn't get it from you, Randy. You're an idiot, but the Holy Spirit revealed Christ and I'm happy and I can go forever. And you know what I mean? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And... Um, well, and I also, you know, this is, this is my opinion. <clears throat> I don't even see any condemnation in somebody who's going through that. <clears throat> but what I do see is, while I, wouldn't con I don't condemn it, I suggest, and I mean this seriously, I suggest that you get off of that wagon and you get on your knees and you just start saying, Lord, I'm really sick of this. I really want you and I want you formed in me. So that I'm never on, but I'm always on. Because here's the truth. If you're always on, then Christ, and Christ is your life, it's going to be okay. But part of the load of being on when it's not Christ is, we're not really sure what Christ is, so we're really taking on extra stuff that isn't Christ based on the law or you know what I mean do you, do you kind of know what I'm talking about based on you know I mean the law is a burden in itself and, and they talked about that in Acts 15 you know well, we, why would we wrap this burden around their neck we never kept it all and why should they see that sounds like me that, you, know, you know I don't believe everybody ought to be in bondage you know <clears throat> the answer is Christ and, and the point you know who is it that's going to come to Jesus, him that is burdened and heavy laden. Okay, so there's there's actually a value <laughs> to burnout yes. if you let it work for the Lord Hallelujah. instead of going, you know, well that plays my God and I, you know, <clears throat> who knows, you know, just do what's Christ in you to do and ask regularly for an increase of Christ that you might lengthen the stakes and broaden the tent so that it'd be more of Christ. That's all. We don't have to condemn one another. We don't have to be down on anybody. We don't have to look down on somebody for this or that and that. Okay, but back to our, our point and that is <clears throat> that, that got us into this and that is I think that there are times that we get upset because <clears throat> somebody that we expected Christ crucified doesn't deliver. The, the truth is, and this is just the truth, you know, whether we walk away with it and try to make it a life principle is up to each individual. But in truth, it really doesn't matter if they do or don't. I mean, it doesn't. What matters is if I do or don't, yes, there is. <laughs> you know. And, and if, it, if that's not the way you think, it may be a situation of the wisdom of this age working in you instead of the mind of Christ. Again, no condemnation. Just, you know, you just have to, it's like you got to lay all this out on the table and look at it real good and go, okay, you know, I don't, know, I don't like that part of this or da-da-da-da, but it is true. <laughs> so Lord, help me. You know, and you pick up this and these, you know, help me with these. <laughs> And, and you go on. He loves you. He wants you to get this. There, he's not, you know, trying to fake you out. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right, let's, uh, let's go to, because um, I want to continue the thought that we've been having here. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I don't know if it'll happen, but if I get satisfactorily through with 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> which you may not believe that I can, but I think it actually might happen this time because I am working 
I mean it, and I, I ask for your prayers. I work constantly on this class when I say work on it. God has revealed all this, but the sheer mass of quantity has to be organized into reasonable thoughts <laughs> and orderly. And right now, I, I'm okay with it. It's like, I see it. <laughs> but, you know, when you see it, it can float around and not be in all the perfect order and stuff. And you can just somehow with those spiritual eyes, it's like, I see the universe. You kind of know what I'm talking about. But when you get ready to teach it, it's like, well, I can't bring that up until this is brought. Well, I can't, you know, and you go, oh, God, I thought seeing Jesus was fun. <laughs> and it really, honestly, I have been, I think I've worked harder on this class than any ever. Um, <clears throat> and right up to the last second. <clears throat> So please, please remind, remember me in your prayers and know that I just, you know, you know, I mentioned I don't take breaks. I still walk my dog. I still walk Rocky. I say, Rocky, you want to go on a walkie? <laughs> I also say, how's life treating you? And he goes, rough. Anyway, sorry, we need to get back to this. <laughs> okay, second, second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. <clears throat> this is Paul talking. But we had the sentence of death. Oh, does that sound familiar to anyone? Where have you heard that? What chapter? What book? First Corinthians, what chapter? Four. <laughs> what verse? Nine. What day of the week is it? <laughs> Who am I? Who are you? Okay. <clears throat> All right. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. Golly, if we could grasp that. The sentence of death is Christ crucified for others, and I'll show you that in just a second in this same book, but it is this, that for others so that life may spring forth for others, but it also works in us so that we won't trust in ourselves. Okay? I'm in this death for a reason. I am in this death not to gain glory or to become somebody. I have embraced this for the resurrection. Okay, so flip over just a, a couple of uh, chapters now. <clears throat> Chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> In verse 11 and 12. 2 <clears throat> Corinthians 4, 11, For we who live <clears throat> are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus may be, may, be, may be made manifest in our mortal flesh, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. <clears throat> All right. So when Paul's talking about the resurrection, folks, he's not talking about something that's going to happen at the end of the thing. That's going to happen as a result, if that happens at all, that's going to happen as a result of Jesus' death. The resurrection of the last days as people understand. Do you understand? That's not going to come from us bearing about any death. Right? The only resurrection that's going to come about from us bearing death, or not the only one, but the primary one, is that we be conformable to his death in that it be selfless for others. And in so doing, our hope in death is resurrection. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. You see? And so, <clears throat> you know, that's okay with some people. That's not okay with everybody. But it is okay with some people. Because some people have <clears throat> seen the Lord enough to know this is how I got brought in. And I would have nothing. Remember what Paul said in verse 7 there, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He said, 
why are you acting so proud and haughty as if you earned something when everything you received, you, it was given to you of Christ crucified? And when you really see that, then the conclusion is, if Jesus is my life, then the Jesus that is my life is Christ crucified. And the mind of it starts, I'm just going to say it like this, starts pushing out that self-centered lack of willingness to be sacrificed. I want everybody else to die. You know what I mean? I want everybody else to sacrifice so that I get. And it begins to be pushed out by the mind of Christ. Then you're willing to embrace this, not because you're anything, not because you're special. Why would you glory as though you didn't receive it? You're not better than somebody who doesn't walk this way. You, because right after that, and in, in chapter one, right after he starts talking about all that, it says, so that he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. <clears throat> I guess I shouldn't say that. <clears throat> All right, so what I wrote here is his terminology is similar to 2 Corinthians 9, uh, 1, 9 with 2 Corinthians 4, 11, and 12, which we just read. Paul's use of the phrase sentence of death in 2 Corinthians 1, 9 seems to be the same as bearing about the dying of Jesus or that of always given up to death. Always, always given up to death. <clears throat> All right, so... When you've entered deep enough into this or far enough into this, you never ask. Now, I know you do early because I did. But when you've entered in, you know, it's like this, it's like this huge thing. And when you, you know, you're sort of going deeper and deeper into the reality of Christ crucified. When you've entered a certain place into this, you no longer ask, why do I always have to die? Now, I'm telling you, I know that you do at a certain juncture, because I did. And, I, and it just didn't, it wasn't fair, because at that point, I didn't have this mind. I was entering into it, but I didn't have it. And I didn't realize that Christ crucified is the greatest picture that God gave us of who he is. And I thought it was something that I did sometimes for you. <laughs> I'm just telling you. You know, you guys go, dang, you were carnal. But I'm just telling you. <laughs> sometimes I did for you, and then sometimes you did for me. And like if I really was needy, it was your turn. Okay? And does that make sense from, you know, that mind before you've fully been saturated? And so um, you no longer ask that. You actually, see, you don't have to embrace the scripture always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord. You don't have to embrace that. You embrace the mind of Christ and you find yourself in agreement by oneness and by, you know, osmosis doing it. Therefore, you go, <gasps> that's happening to me by Christ. Yes. No, it doesn't. It's just not the fullness of 
dead. Right. You know? It, it hasn't, it's like that osmosis hasn't fully enveloped us and saturated us. Uh, you can't say, like Jesus did on the cross, it is finished. Right. right. Yet. <laughs> you okay. know what I mean? That death hasn't completed its work yet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Deb? Yeah. Romans 15, I don't know if you mentioned this in earlier classes, but it, to me, I feel like it's talking about Christ and him crucified. But in verse 5, it says, Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one towards another, according to Christ Jesus, according to Christ. Jesus. <laughs> well, we actually will get deeply into that chapter uh, <clears throat> once we get rolling here. But, yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I was going to make a comment on something here. Always giving up to death. If I can just start the engine running, maybe it'll it'll come more clear. Um, when uh, oh, because I, I I wanted to continue on what I was saying in the sense of um, the, we have nothing to glory in for our salvation. We didn't earn any of it, right? But that scripture in First Corinthians four um, seven. It's not talking about our salvation. It's talking about us and what we have received from the Lord. And if there's anything that comes out of us, it came by Christ crucified. <clears throat> He's the avenue. And that once you begin to recognize, like Paul did, I, I am the less than the least of all saints. I am the last one God should have not only say, but call me into this ministry as an apostle. I am the furthest thing. You know, I was the biggest. There was no bigger enemy of God on the planet. And it shattered him so deeply that this thing, is. Not, you know, we say it's by grace, but it, there is something so much more powerful in it. it for him, it he didn't see it just as grace as we understand it. He saw it as God. He saw it as Christ crucified. He said, this is God. This is, this is the way God is. This is nothing like the law. I, I can't earn anything in this. There's nothing. And so when he talks to these guys and says, why do you boast as though you had received something, you know, or that you had something of your own to glory in when, you know, it all came from him and through him. Paul has been shattered from the very beginning. <clears throat> Chris and I were talking about this before class and just, you know, that whole process. It just shattered him right down to his last days. I'm less than the least of all. I am least. I'm less than the least. Most people would, would willingly say, okay, I'm the least, because it makes you humble looking or something. But to be less than the least is, <clears throat> you know, th this has come about not by grace. Yes, it is grace. But see, he would say grace of Christ crucified. Because that's him. That's who he is. He's not just extending a, a um, scroll with a um, remission. Grace. Isn't that what most people call it? <laughs> He's not. That's him. Oh, my God. This is the way he is. <clears throat> and he just, he just said, I'm determined not to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. He said, all this other stuff... Is just fluff around it. He said, I did that. I was a Pharisee. I studied doctrines. I knew doctrines and I didn't know the Lord. Right. And he was just, you know, I can just never put it into words what I saw, much less I can't even imagine what he saw. But I hear it in his words and I sense it in him. We were talking about that earlier too, that Paul is not the theologian I thought he was. I mean, I was, a, I was, I'm sorry, I was of Berean. <laughs> and Berean 
looked at Paul as the, the best theologian around, the most highly respectable man who could set forth. He wasn't that at all. He was a broken, shattered being who had nothing to cling to but Christ and him crucified. And if you see that, you are deeply impressed with a man who's just like almost disappeared so that Christ crucified, so that this could actually really be what, you know, uh, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It's Christ that liveth in me. And the life, I, what you see in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves by giving himself for me. And that he, that one lives in me. And that I'm crucified. You see, you just, I just, that's how I do Galatians 2.20 now. It just keeps going in a circle. You can't, you can't leave the first part without the last part. And uh, so I better move on. <laughs> um, so in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12, we see how death, uh, we see how death in himself seems to be the means Paul has embraced in order for there to be life in others. That he has, that he, like Christ crucified, you see, and, and the thing that has amazed me in my searching lately is every critical point, when Paul gets to that critical place, he makes sure that you know if he's talking about what he did or what happened in him, that it goes back to Christ crucified, not Jesus or God at work in me in that sense. Christ crucified is the pattern, and Christ crucified becomes the life in him that lives after the same pattern that he did at the cross. You know, And so... Um, uh, we see how death in himself seems to be the means Paul has embraced in order for there to be life in others because he sees the cross as, well, this, this was the wisdom of God. This changed everything. This was the power of God. <laughs> and he's just like, I, I love that. You know, I can just hear him say, I love the cross. I love this way. You know, and yes, it's foolish, and yes, there's hurt and rejection and all this stuff, but I don't take it as deeply as, as I would have had I had that other mind because this is what I'm called to, a life of Christ crucified living in me, and I'm not ashamed of this gospel, you know. <clears throat> uh, we also see how in verses 7 through 9 show that these sufferings are not victorious over him to his own destruction, but that in verses 10 through 12 they're shown to be the impetus for life in others because cast down, not forsaken, da-da-da-da. You know, there is, you know, there is bad stuff that happened to Jesus. But he embraced it, didn't he? There is bad stuff that happened to Paul. But I'm going to tell you right now, it didn't have to happen to Jesus or Paul. They both had status and power and uh, influence enough for it to not happen to them. They could have reversed it, both of them. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels or whatever, split the earth in two and had everybody drop into hell or something. I mean, you know, the, the possibilities with him are endless. Paul was a Roman citizen, was also of very well respected in Tarsus, which was basically a Roman uh, city with Greek influence, but he was also a Pharisee, raised at the feet of Gamaliel. You can't get any higher than that. I mean, I remember, I remember being a, a young, naive Christian just reading the Bible and going, why in the world didn't Paul use this influence? Why didn't he stay a Pharisee and go to the other Pharisees and say, look, dudes, I can show you in the word of God, you know what I mean? And I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to work my way up to be high priest and I'm going to convert the nation. Why didn't he do that? I mean, I remember just like, you know, I don't get that at all, man. If I had that stuff, I'd have really used it to glorify Jesus. 
But in, <clears throat> yeah, that's right, it is. That's exactly right. <clears throat> and so, you know, Paul does just the opposite. I mean, he, he goes out on the road. He doesn't tell anybody he's a Pharisee anymore. He quit being Saul of Tarsus, and he becomes small, Paul. He becomes small, and he's, he's getting beat up, and he's getting thrown in prison. And I'm going, you know, this is the worst. You know, I remember now, I'm young and naive. This is the worst witness you could have, Paul. This is not a good witness. You know, you're in jail all the time, dude. You know? Well, clearly, I was a Corinthian. Yes. <laughs> I either have 10 minutes or Ke Kelly's really being influenced. She's going. I think she's wanting me to get the fact that I only have 10 minutes left, so she's giving it with, it's like, and do you see this? I'm going, you know, I'm telling me, worship me not, worship God. <laughs> now she's doing like this. <laughs> All right. Um, Notice how that death is described in terms of life's negative circumstances. Um, and that's what he talks about here. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. <clears throat> so notice how that death, the, the, the death that, that he's uh, saying, death worketh in me, that life may work in you, it's connected to life circumstances. Um, and that those circumstances should be approached in terms of death, loss, self-emptying, self-giving, and weakness based on the power and wisdom seen in Christ crucified. Was that a mouthful? <laughs> but it is true. You can't get away from it. I mean, you know, you can't read verse 12 and go, well, so then death worketh in me, but life in you. And then just go, well, the death is something that happened 2,000 years ago that in my heart and mind, I believe that, you know, you know, some weird mystical da da da. He's talking about, look, people are persecuting me. They're saying bad stuff about me. I am this, counted as the scum of the earth, remember? Chapter four of, of First Corinthians. <clears throat> um, so this way of Christ crucified is not just identified by various acts of self-giving during the week but as a life sentence to which he has resigned himself unto and gone as far as to embrace as God's way. Because at first you resign yourself to it because you, you do. You sort of go, okay, this is, this is the truth. I fought it, but it won. <laughs> and I, you know what? Most of you don't know this. Deb knows this. <clears throat> when I was in Bible school and heard this, Buddy boy, I fought it. I fought it. I fought the truth. I was like Paul. I stood up against it like he persecuted the church. I persecuted my church. And I mean, I rebuked him. I stood up. I, said, well, I quoted scripture to him. And then they, you know, somebody later pulled me aside and go, have you ever known, you know, we're, you know, we're the, I, why are you people, you know, don't you know, you know, you're always talking about Jesus and everything. We're the righteousness of God now. You need to wake up to the new creation. And some guy pulled me aside and said, have you ever noticed that it says we're the righteousness of God in Christ? And I went, dang, you know, I never noticed those last two words. <laughs> oh, darn, you know. And it took about 50 of those to, you know, I mean, I was like a big prideful tree being cut down by the sword of the spirit. And finally, uh, you know, you get cut down to a certain place where you hadn't tumbled over yet into death, but you have resigned yourself. Oh, God, this is the truth. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, really, it's sort of like, it's like oh, brother, I'm going to have to live. If, the, if I believe this is the truth, I'm going to have to live this way. 
I'll never be that great evangelist I wanted to be. You know, nobody will ever like me. <laughs> and sure enough. <laughs> okay. Um, so I said, he, which he has resigned himself unto and gone as so far as to embrace as God's way. This, you know what, this is God's way, doggone it. I love Jesus. I love God. I, you know, sorry, I'm quoting an old movie, damn the torpedoes, you know, <clears throat> let's go. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, For Paul, this is his lifelong sentence, which is to proceed in death, trusting that it will result in glory to God and life to others. This is my sentence, and I, I, I embrace it. I receive it. This sentence of death may involve appearing as one worthy of reproach, appearing as the leftovers that may may not affect you as much but you know what when you get left over and over when you get when you are looked at like um, yesterday's half-eaten meal and I'm not interested I'd like steak you kind of that's why I put it in there because I you know I felt like I understood that word in a proper way that, you know, you're just what's left over. You're not, you're not significant, you know? And you're not significant, not because you're not significant, but because you have actually chosen the way of Christ crucified. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Yes. Well, it is, because in a certain sense, that's where you get, and I don't want to get into it right now, but that's where you get, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he has consigned you to death, and you have to go through, um, like I said, I don't want to get into it too much right now. I will eventually. <clears throat> but you have to go through a time period where it feels like, because you've given up so much of feelings and blessings and this and that that it feels like God's left you and he hasn't left you at all you are on the verge of entering into what he's really all about and that you know there's no explanation for all that right now and and uh, that could all be misconstrued and stuff <clears throat> so forget everything I just said sleep sleep forget the last sentences sleep wake up okay You know, somebody's going to splice this out, put it on YouTube, and go, he's hypnotizing people. <laughs> he's a cult leader that's, that's hypnotizing people. <laughs> oh, God. Can't win for losing. But, you know, you can't because of the wisdom of this age. They don't even understand that. All right, I'm going to finish this sentence because Kelly's either going... You're number one, or Jesus is number one, or I only got one minute, so I better quit talking. This sentence of death may involve appearing as one worthy of reproach, appearing as the leftovers, being slandered for their, uh, you being sl slandered for your crucified stance, but refusing to justify yourself. And when slandered, you speak blessing. Let's pray. Father, we just ask you, to continue to open our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our spirit to these things and that you will break the bread of life, you will impart the mind of Christ, you will make real
who you are in us. Father, I pray release for those who might have been striving to bear up under some of this. Lord, let them be released until you reveal the life of it. And Lord, may all expectations from their heart be dropped, placed upon themselves. Lord, they love you. They are after you. And I pray that in your timing, you'll make real all of the desires of their hearts concerning conforming. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity for us to fellowship in your son and for the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to, as I sense him joyfully moving in our midst because he loves lifting up Jesus so much. Please continue to bless our gatherings with your presence and with the reality that your presence is meant to manifest and to show forth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.